members of the Brisbane Baylands Community Advisory Group, um, you have an agenda before you. Is can we? Is there any discussion about on the agenda? Approval. Second. Do I have second. a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Uh, we have a very exciting presentation in store for us tonight. Dr. Alex Horn, uh, Professor Emeritus from UC Berkeley, uh, and someone who has devoted several decades to uh, researching uh, the cleanup of contaminants through the use of wetlands and natural process systems. He is an internationally known expert in the field. Um, Dr. Horn has been involved in one um, uh, wetland for, uh, for contaminant cleanup in China that is 100,000 acres. No, 10,000. 10, oh, I'm sorry. 10,000. Yeah, it's big. It's really big. I'm going for 10,000. <laughs> Why did I think it was? Okay. Anyway. Um, so that'll give you an idea of, uh, of Dr. Horn's expertise, and without any further ado, let oh, It's nice to be here. Is this working? Yes. You can hear it? Yes. Okay. Good. Then it's going on the machine. Okay. So first of all, I'm not a real engineer. I'm a fake. I've taught in the engineering department at Berkeley for over 30 years. But my training was biochemistry, limnology, oceanography, ecology, and then I started work in engineering. And I've taught, of course, engineering for many years. Part of what I did is start in a, a department called sanitary engineering. We then moved to environmental engineering, and then I took part of the department to what we call ecological engineering. And it's ecological engineering which is the root of what I want to tell you about for contaminant removal. Let's get it clear. There's nothing that I can do with any of my natural processes that can't be done as well or better in a smaller, more compact system using conventional engineering. But you'll see why you might prefer the alternative. So let's have a look what we've got. I know nothing, of course, about your problems and your area except what I've read. So you'll have to excuse me for those faults. This is summary, a summary almost of, of what I th where I think you might go. The upper part is obviously from your EIR on the Baylands. The lower one is sanctuary wetlands in Irvine, one of the ones I'm proud of. Irvine being in Orange County is somewhat different to the Bay Area. But they're very innovative in some ways. And this is a 300-acre uh, a park-type wetland uh, which also cleans up uh, contaminants. Okay, so this is my idea of what, the, what we're dealing with here. We've got a great site, we've got views, you've got the location, you've got the climate. You've got an educated population, you've got regula educated regulators, which is, you know, good. It doesn't always happen. Uh, and you've got developers who are also educated because it's the Bay Area. You've got a fair amount of room, considering where we are, and you require some small mitigation wetlands right now. So some wetlands are going to be there anyway. The problems, obviously, in all about this, you've got old bay fill. You've got multiple pollution problems, you know, a whole uh, laundry list of pollutants. And all developments in the Bay Area are difficult. We all know that. But they're not only difficult here, except in China, which is a dictatorship. Uh, they're difficult in most places. You've got sea level rise. And you've also, in my opinion, you could use not little wetlands, but big wetlands, which are treatment wetlands, which are beautiful and have wildlife and can also be parks. So that's the essence of the tale. This is what I read from your EIR. A fair amount of office retail industrial. You either want no homes, some homes, or more homes. Uh, you've got a park of various sizes, depending on what you put in there. Oh, I didn't mention the event center, uh, which is also obviously an alternative. You've got a lagoon, which obviously you know about. You've got a few wetlands, you've got little wildlife, you've got some beauty, you want, you want safe water, and the, de the design looks to me a bit mundane, I'm afraid to say. Uh, but that's only a plan, of course, they're always like that. 
Can we do better? I think NTS, the natural treatment system, makes you can, we, we, with that we can do better. The contaminant threats from, from Bayfill, from pollution, tend to go on a long time. In particular, some compounds, you just can't scrape them all out. They seep in from the cracks, particularly organics. So you might have a long history of continuing to remove contaminants. And you're not the only one. Just about everybody does. Just behind Berkeley, we have a mine. We actually have one on the campus, too. And it's dribbling in copper, you know, and that kind of stuff. So it happens. So continuous treatment for a long time might be a good idea if it doesn't look too bad. And I think such treatment can be combined with beauty and wildlife in what we call natural treatment systems. This is a concept that came out of my last sabbatical about 20 years ago uh, when I was working with the developers in Irvine, uh, in Irvine, in fact, the city of Irvine. Irvine is easy to work with because there's only the Irvine company, there's the city, and there's, which is essentially the, the county in this case, and there is the uh, Irvine Ranch Water District, which de deals with all the water. And we came up with this natural treatment system, and that's a picture of it back there, and we've published it in various journals, so you can read about it, and I think it's a fine success. However, there's a paradigm in development which has come out uh, with the advent of natural treatment systems. The old, old idea, I call them gray. A gray city is what I was brought up in. It's Oakland, it's San Francisco. They're all gray. The modern ones, and according to the economist, uh, Tinjan, which is in China, is the first modern eco-city but really, it's not the first. It just looks like Irvine or these places with a bunch of trees. So it's green. So eco is green for us. But I think you can go further than green. I think you can have an ecological city. I think you can actually, instead of having a bunch of trees that just sit there and look pretty, you can have trees that look there and look pretty, but perhaps they, they're specially designed for some kind of birds or butterflies or viewing, something a bit more modern than we've been doing in the past. Okay, now is the slight problem, unwanted chemicals. You've got a laundry list, and you sent me a bunch of those. And, you know, we know how to deal with them. You've got, I read some of the EIRs, and I know some of the companies that are working with them. These can be fixed at various costs. Some of, will, some of them will continue, and some of them need to be treated in a conventional manner. But some of them I think we can polish. I think there's the difference. Conventional treatments for pollutants are easy when there's plenty of pollutants. But as the pollutants get lower and lower, the cost of removing them gets higher and higher. With a wetland, you can take the high cost and reduce it. So if a wetland is combined with conventional treatment, and this is not any old wetlands, this is, these are designed wetlands, you can then get a better job for less money. And this is just some puffery to show you where I've worked. Uh, these are all working wetlands of various sizes uh, in the world. And my textbook on limnology, which gave me some credibility once, at, once over. Okay, so how can, we, how can we solve your pollution problems, your contaminant problems at low cost? Well, a combination of conventional engineering and wetlands may be an answer. And ecological engineering here is our flagship, uh, and treatment wetlands tend to be the answer. This is, gives you an idea. There's conventional treatment and ecological treatment. Conventional treatment, high use of fossil fuels, uh, think of things like membrane filtration, uh, high use of oxygen, uh, steel contain concrete containers, a lot of energy to mix everything around, and no conjunctive uses. You never take the, the kids down to look at the sewage treatment plant. Right? It just doesn't happen. But if you have green tech, as I call it, or ecological, the solar energy is built in. The energy to run a, a wetland is the plants that grow and die. When they die, they're young fossil fuel. They're only two years old, but it's fossil fuel in a sense. That's where the energy comes from. The plants don't take things up magically. That's not what you want. You want the plants to grow, provide you the energy, the carbon energy, and die. And then the bacteria will work for you. You, you need to move a bunch of earth usually, but there's little concrete or steel. Some, sometimes I think I need something titanium to make it sexy, but I can't think of anything yet. There's many conjunctive uses. Uh, in one of my wetlands, the big one in China, we had 200,000 visitors last year. The one in Irvine gets about 10,000 a year, I think, and it's fairly small hard to get to. Uh, so it's sustainable, minimal energy, it's everything we want, but is it good enough? Well, the flagship of ecological engineering, this field that I've developed, with others of course, remember, I'm a, enough of an engineer that when I say, I did it, we did it, it's a team, you know. Sometimes I got the best idea, sometimes anyone else did. We all claim some credit. Engineering work is teamwork, and so most of my work is teamwork. This is a very old wetland in Haywood that actually takes out metals from the neighboring uh, 
watershed. And you can see this little bird floating around. It was a big bird floating around in there. So this is one of our local ones, an early one. This wasn't well designed, but it's, you know, 30 years old. This is the deal. Here's the old beaver saying to the young beaver, yeah, sure, kid. You start out working for the ecosystem, but pretty soon you make the ecosystem work for you. That's what we do in ecological engineering. We use nature's way. We make things comfortable for the bugs, the plants, the animals. We want to help us, and they help us. It's a mutual symbiotic relationship. We're not forcing anything on. And of course, according to Bill Mitch, who wrote the textbook on wetlands, uh, beavers were the first ecological engineers. At Cal, we've extended this, this technology to uh, what we call unit process uh, natural treatment systems. And this is the key to what we can do now with our wetland system. Unit process is what engineers do. You know, if you go into a car factory, it's not all a heap of parts in one place. You build the chassis first, then you put the wheels on, then you get the, paint, the body from the paint shop. Each of those is a unit process. Everything's a unit process in industry. Well, that's what we do too. We now make the wetlands unit process. It's not just a bunch of water and plants. Each cell that's, so we have a wetland, could be two acres, it could be 100 acres, but each wetland cell does a specific purpose. It's designed to do a specific purpose. Take out nutrients, perhaps, take out metals, take out pharmaceuticals, but they're all different. And that's something that's new. We've published it and a few things, but you can see the publications are between probably 2005 and 2013. This is an example of three unit processes. You can see this one actually was designed for Southern California. You can see the first part, we have some cattails. The cattails are best, actually, because there's a lot of available carbon. When a cattail sinks, it dies pretty quickly, so the energy is released pretty quickly. And so we can take out things like nitrate, and nitrate's a big pollutant in our waters. It causes eutrophication. Uh, we might want to trap sediments in another pool, and in the second pool, in this case, we've shown bulrushes. That might be better for taking out pesticides or organics. Just as activated carbon or activated charcoal in your filter in your water, your water system, it takes out organics, I can make it naturally with dead plants. <coughs> and that one was, uh, was also available. Okay. We can use, remove, using this system, with each wetland doing a different task, or each cell of the wetland doing a different task, we can take out mundane chemicals like nitrogen, we can take out more complicated ones like heavy metals, and even fancy ones, I think that's ibuprofen, uh, pharmaceuticals, which is the big worry we have right now, because the ones I'm taking out go straight through waste treatment plants. If a waste treatment plant could get rid of them easily, I wouldn't be dealing with them. They'd already be gone. I'm dealing with the ones, it's not that you can't take them out with a waste treatment plant, it's just the cost gets higher. Some things are really hard to take out with standard waste treatment plants. Some things are easy. And the same is true with wetlands. A wetland can't handle raw waste. Uh, no way. So you need to work in conjunction. It's a, it's a symbiosis, again, between the conventional and the ecological engineering. They're probably the most zero energy and sustainable systems ever invented. I think I can run them for 10,000 years with almost no energy. Uh, and I've also devised ways to make them beautiful. It's not very difficult, really, if you're an ecologist. You just talk to some... Well, I mean, I'm a bit of a bird or two. You know, it's not difficult to make things good for birds. And that's our latest publication which talks about the removal of uh, trace organic contaminants and pathogens, because we can also take those out, from my colleagues at Stanford and Berkeley. Okay, this is an example to give you an example of what we've done. This is Crystal Gardens in Phoenix, Arizona. It's 3,500 homes, started in 1995 and finished in 99. The developer wanted 50 acres of ornamental lakes, since you can get more money for a developer if you have some home on the water, so to speak. Looks good. The city said, you know, this is a desert, get lost. So after some going back and forth, uh, the city said, well, if you clean up our water supply, we'll give you 50 acres. So I devised a system where we actually uh, make things that look like lakes with little islands in, but in fact they're uh, unit process treatment systems. And I'll show you a bit more about that. This is from Pace Engineering who built it. These are some students looking across, and you can see it looks like lakes with little islands in. But what happens, and the other picture shows you 40 of these in a row, so we get lots of homes around it or parks or whatever. The water comes from the contaminated source, which is an old agricultural canal. It goes 
in a pipe, it comes up into the wetland. You can't see it, of course, because it's hidden. It goes between hidden berms, it's treated, it goes down a sinker, it goes on the pond, it comes to another wetland island with a little riser, and down, and so on. And there are 40 of these. And at the end, the water's all cleaned up. So the visitors get, to, the residents get to use it, and the water gets cleaned up. Everybody happy, I hope. This is just another diagram of the decorative islands. They look like decorative islands, but actually they're working islands. They work to remove uh, nutrients in this case. Now, the reason I can do this is because wetlands are chemical transformers. Wetlands can do things that we can't do anywhere else. Why is this? Most of the soil and the water and everything you see is full of oxygen. But there are many processes which go only in the absence of oxygen. And there aren't many places, in fact, only 4% of the world's surface is low in oxygen. Well, that's a wetland. Wetlands are defined as, I'll sing it for you, shallow water, hydric soils, and adapted plants. Shallow water, hydric soils, and adapted plants. I would have brought the guitar, but it was a bit of a push to do it today. Shallow water, yeah, foot is so deep. Hydric soils, hydric means flooded. A flooded soil has no oxygen very quickly. Once you've got no oxygen, you can make all sorts of reactions go. But of course, if I want an oxygenated one, then I build an oxygenated cell next to it. So I can have no oxygen, oxygen, partial oxygen. With the unit process, you can do anything. It's magic. This is some transformations you might get. Nitrate is a big pollutant problem we have, especially in the West. From farms, from landscaping, nitrate's very soluble. You put it on your plants. The plants are not 100% efficient, no matter how good a farmer you are, how good anybody you are. And even if you don't put fertilizer on at all, nitrogen's going to come off. Uh, well, we can transform it to nitrogen gas because imagine you're a bacteria sitting in the bottom of, of a wetland. There's no oxygen. So, you know, how are you going to breathe? I mean, it's called terminal electron receptor, but how are you going to breathe, so to speak? Well, NO3, maybe that's got some oxygen in there. So you strip it and send out the nitrogen gas back again. So that's one way that wetlands are very good. We can remove nitrogen simp as simply as that, so long as we make the conditions good for the bacteria that do the process. Heavy metals, they come from mines, brake linings, tires, gutters. I even found that the shopping cart, you know, you, you're supposed to throw your shopping cart in the creek when you're finished with it. Uh, they contain cadmium plating, uh, and cadmium's not a nice metal. So uh, they all get in the river, and the way we can treat them is we can turn them back into the insoluble ores from which they were manufactured in the first place. We can actually complete the cycle if we have control over the oxygen and the, uh, the organic carbon. Pesticides, we all know where pesticides and organics come from. Uh, we can destroy them or immobilize them. You can't destroy everything. Sometimes you just have to absorb it. Well, I can destroy it later, but not right now. Pharmaceuticals from human waste and so on. Again, we've got a whole process of using an entirely new wetland I invented only about 10 years ago to remove these uh, compounds. And it's not just pharmaceuticals, it's all sorts of other things like polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that's your car dripping. Sometimes if I go to meetings and people are dubious, I'll take a sheet of white paper and stick it under their car and show them what happens while we're talking. And there's a drip, right? That drip has got some toxic material in it, some of which is benzpyrene, you know, smoking stuff, the smoking cancer stuff. About 1% of that running down your gutters is that same nastiness. And we can get rid of it. So what's new? This was a sign, actually, in my hometown. And I was coming along to it, and my friend who was from America said, what, what, what's going on? Do I have to change religions? What, what's happening here? But, but no, we have to change priorities in our waste treatment. Sustainable green. OK, these are not your mother's wetlands. Constructed wetlands are accepted. Everybody builds them. When I go to China, they say, everybody can build one. I say, yeah, but they don't work very well. They're fine for what they were, but we need to move them on further along. So they've been designed haphazardly. And they're not really very good at removing stuff. They're great, but they're not very efficient. So we can make them more efficient. The challenge, can we improve them to meet specific targets? I mean, when you've got a contaminant and it's going into the bay or into anywhere where you might get, you want a specific level. It's step by, by law. You need to make that standard. Can you make the standard? And can we make them safe not only for us but for birds and other wildlife? Remember, we don't all need the same standards. For example, the copper standard in San Francisco Bay is very low. It's about three, four, five micrograms per liter. Your standard is 1,000 because you don't have gills. You know? So it's, it's different. Standards are different for different things. 
Okay, here's example two, Discovery Bay. Discovery Bay is at, what, 6,000 people up the road a bit about an hour, well, two hours from here. Uh, they put copper piping in its new homes, a fairly affluent community, but the, the copper leached out, they couldn't take it out with conventional engineering, and it was going into the bay, and so it was causing problems. What do we do? Well, uh, it's not the only one. This is copper in Strawberry Creek in Berkeley and a few other creeks around Berkeley. This is brake linings. These are, I'm good to say, not my Corvette, which has got good brake linings. These are German cars, usually. Uh, you know, you put copper in a brake lining because it, doesn't, it dissipates the heat. So when you put your foot on hard, some little particles drop out. They contain copper. When you drive a little faster or drive a little slower, it doesn't matter, your tires where you get zinc. So we get metals from, from our natural uh, surroundings. Wetlands trap particles and sediments. So it's TMI. There's a song about this too, as you might think, but I'm not going to sing that one. <laughs> you trap particles and sediment. The particles may have most of the copper. They may have a lot of the pesticides, but some are soluble and get through. What pollutants you get through, you metabolize. You make things good for the bugs so they'll metabolize them, and you make it sure that you immobilize them. Because when I do these meetings, people say, well, we like wetlands, we don't like pollutants, where are they going? Any of you remember selenium in the Kesterson Reservoir? I spent 10 years there, and I never want that to happen again. So we need to, you know, think ahead, Mo immobilize them. How do you build one? They're not too difficult to build. This is a bunch of students and faculty that I persuaded to go out there in the heat, out to Discovery Base. It gets to be about 100 there this time of year. And you can see within one year, the lower part shows you uh, the growth of, in this case, cattails. So it's not something you need to take a long time about. I went through this before, so this is what we're thinking of. Wetlands are chemical transformers. And this is the results from the Discovery Bay data you can see. Coming in about 15 micrograms per liter, you probably would like it to be about two, three, three five, seven. Certainly you don't want it 15. The, the conventional treatment had taken it down to 15. This is not untreated waste, but they couldn't get any further. But as you can see, we were able to get the copper down by you know, anywhere between 70 and 90%, depending on which fraction we're looking at. And the same for some other metals. So it's a good example of heavy metals, and you have some of those problems with heavy metals here. But we need to know where they go. Well, where they go is they go down to insoluble sulfides. It's a long-term sink. They don't hang around, and that's why we can have wildlife at the same time. These metals are rapidly removed by the bacteria before they can get into the, into the organisms. Just as well. Here's example number four. This is sanctuary wetlands. It's anywhere between 100 and 350 acres. There's 100 acres of wet, wet areas, and then there's about another 200 acres of semi-wet and, and riparian zones. Um, in this case, it was a bunch of old duck ponds. We have a river running through, uh, it's called San Diego Creek for some reason, but it's running through Irvine. It was carrying a lot of nitrate from the old strawberry fields and the old developments. When it got down into Newport Bay, it caused algae, seaweeds, to such an extent that they block the engines of those half a million dollar boats that are parked around Newport Bay, if you've ever been down there. This, of course, caused problems, and so we thought, well, <laughs> we can take it out with the wetland, and this is what we did with the wetland. But not just a wetland for removal of pollutants, this is a wetland for wildlife. It's five minutes from the airport. You can take a lunch break from central Irvine, walk down there, walk around and look at birds, uh, including some very rare birds like the black skimmer. And in this case, uh, about, I think it's about 100 upper income condos are built at the top end of the place, uh, helped the financial situation for everybody there. Uh, but the, the, the net result is we've got some people, of course everybody around there, not only the ones in these condos, takes advantage of it. We have 220 species of birds. It's a wonderful place to see birds. It's a nice place to stroll, and pollution is removed from the creek. Okay, here's just an example. In the early days, we were put in about uh, 10 CFS through. The creek only runs 20 CFS in summer, and they won't let me take all the water because it would dry up, obviously. And you can see 13 milligrams of nitrate in and 3 milligrams out. I'll give you a lot with nitrate, but we now know that nitrate's a good analog for almost other pollutants. So if most of the nitrate's going, most of the other pollutants are going too. It's just easier to measure the nitrate sometimes. This is the site plan. Uh, in this case, there's a water, water supply and treatment plant in, in the area. You can see the ponds at the bottom. 
we've got some riparian mitigation wetlands and the condos at the top and then the whole area is surrounded by industrial uh, well it's commercial and uh, homes and that kind of thing example five is in, recently in china things go a bit faster in china because it's a dictatorship so it's easier to do things sometimes but Remember, they have left and right, too. They're on the same party, but they have left wing and right wing, and they fight. So it's just like being in America, really. Uh, this is Ningbo. Uh, Ningbo's about uh, 50 kilometers south of Shanghai, to put you where, where this is. So that's 35 million people sitting there. And they, they, they were like parks, like everyone else. So they built a 34-kilometer bridge from Shanghai, and I got an off-ramp from it right to my wetland. Now, this wetland is 10,000 acres, of which about 3,000 has been modified. And it gave me a chance to work on a larger scale. I worked with the mayor. You can see what it looked like. That's the Ningbo, the city. It's a small city by their standards, only 4 million. And here we go. This is a, an early design of the treatment system. This is the kind of thing I think you would need here or anywhere else. You have somewhere for it's a unit process system, somewhere for the birds, somewhere for the wildlife, somewhere for the people. Uh, that's what it looks like last year. That's me wrapped up against the coal there. 3,000 acres of treated part here, educational center, 200,000 vi visitors last year. That's a pretty large visitor grouping for most places. 200 species of birds, pollutants reduced. And it was all going to be factories or farms before me and the World Bank got in and helped them change direction. They weren't unwilling, really. Okay, now what about here? Can we use unit process natural treatment systems, wetland parks, for Brisbane Bayshore? The one on the top and bottom is the one in uh, Crystal Gardens in Phoenix. Um, you've got somewhere between 200 and 300 acres. Uh, the kind of parks I've seen designed, I think, are nice. They're just open areas where you might throw frisbees. There's no ecological value to them particularly. Uh, they're not bad, you know, I mean, green space is just nice. But I think we can do a lot better than that. Um, one of the things about a wetland is you don't have to put them all together. You can put one here, one there. It doesn't matter. They can be big, they can be small. It works quite well. Uh, they can be integrated with the proposed wastewater si w polishing wetlands that I saw in Brown and Coles Wells' proposal, proposal were already here for your waste treatment system, if you have one here, and also with the shoreline mitigation wetlands. One of the things we're very short of in the Bay Area is freshwater wetlands. We have a lot of seawater wetlands, you know, we keep building them and buying them, but there's still very, very few freshwater wetlands. So a freshwater wetland, especially if you could power it with the water that you've cleaned up from your own site and rainwater, would be a real addition to the Bay Area. The Laguna need management too, the Laguna whatever lakes. Um, when I'm not doing wetlands, I do lake management and ocean management too. Uh, so I fixed a bunch of them, and there are a bunch of methods you can go through to see what you need to do. But most of them include something like aeration, manipulation, and perhaps dredging. We've just finished a project that I've been involved in, dredging Mountain Lake and restoring it in many ways to its former beauty. And that could happen here, of course. That's all, folks. Now, I've come here to answer questions, so... I think the easiest thing for us to do at this point would be for anyone who has a question or comment to come up to the podium. That way we can um, easily get the comments um, recorded on, on the film. And Before we start, I've been reminded that, that um, we want everybody to get a chance to ask their question or make their comment. So if people would limit themselves the first, each time around to one or two questions or comments and then make room for the next person. Thank you.
want to see you. Very good. So imagine hypothetically that you had a very large contaminated piece of land and um, we would like to put wetlands on some of it, but maybe other parts of it, the landowner might like to have shops or houses or sandboxes or whatever. And I'm wondering about the relationship and safety. You talked about the cleaning process where, you know, dirty stuff comes in on one side and it comes out clean on the other side. But if the public's walking around the whole thing, what is the incidental exposure, you know, on and around the wetlands? And is there any benefit to, or, or is, is there any way that the wetlands can help in the remediation of adjacent areas that don't become part of the wetlands? Uh, that's a very good question, and, and I'm not talking about volatiles here. Volatiles that come out have to be treated in different ways. I'm talking about the things that are leached out in, in the water, because that's usually where we see it most. Uh, a good example is Emeryville. They couldn't really fix Emeryville, so they paved it over, and it's got shops and houses and homes and things, and people, obviously that's a barrier, to understand. But anything that runs out underneath... Uh, then you just put it in a pipe and take it to your wetland. The incidental exposure walking around the wetland, you know, we'd have to look at each compound by chance, but there is no hazard that we've ever come across that way. The stuff is in the water, it stays in the water. Normally, there's no public use of the water in the sense you don't swim in it normally, you just look at it. Uh, you could take it to the next step, but they, usually you don't. Um, so I think walking around is fine, again, with the, the caveat that it's not, uh, you're not swimming in it uh, or other water contact sports generally and it's easy to transport the stuff in a pipe or you could make you know I've done some in fact one of my favorite ones I didn't mention is a winery wetland in Lodi where you have a big winery I mean this is when they first talked to me about it I, I thought oh, it's you know 60,000 cases no they have 8 million cases so it's a big winery but I built them a little park and little area where they could sit around their wetland and uh, that seems to work fine, you know, the, 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 but I could have had it right in the middle of where they were cr crushing the grapes and they could have just, instead of walking, you know, a quarter of a mile, they could have done it right there. And I worked with one developer, we never built this development, but he eventually moved his wetlands right into the middle of his community because then people could look at them. Uh, you have to be careful and, of course, sometimes you need to do some conventional stuff up, up front at the site too. Not everything can be brought in. Uh, but wetlands can be designed to treat just about everything. So I, I think that's what I would do. Uh, if, you, if you're talking about homes and gardens, then you'd need a, a pre-remediation probably of the metals first. But any of, the, any of the incidentals, the lower stuff that comes off when it rains, you know, these lovely copper finishes on your roof, the zinc plated gutters, uh, it's all contaminants. The uh, material you make your roof from, it all dribbles down, it's PAHs, it's other organics, and they can all be removed. Rain gardens is one way to remove them, but I don't like that because I don't know where it goes. I'd rather put it through the rain garden and get it to somewhere where we can really deal with it in a better sense. That answer the question? Okay. I have two questions. One is uh, about wetlands and landfills, and how you might combine those two because we have a 325 acre landfill. The second question is how you have worked and what you might have to say that would be helpful to us about working with the regulators uh, that you've worked with like Integrated Waste Board and the uh, Regional Water Quality Control Board. Okay, Thank so the you. first question again was? Was about uh, using wetlands the, in, in the, relation to the, a landfill. Yeah. Well, there are two or three things. One is a wetland, uh, the water tends to go through a wetland, but pretty soon it doesn't. It, it blocks, it clogs itself. Uh, so most of the large wetlands, you just let the water run through. If you let it th run through into a, bay f into a landfill and the landfill has toxicants, they will eventually come back out the other end and then you would treat them. The other way you can do it is to use a geomembrane underneath. And this is what we do if we're dealing already with toxic material we're not very happy with, like chromium. And you'd put a barrier underneath that. And, and these things last. Geo, Geo membrane. It's, it's heavy duty plastic stuff. Oh. <laughs> it's, but they're, they're uh, 
they're widely used for holding nasty materials and, and other materials too. And they're, they're relatively cheap. Um, so that would be the answer to that question, that depending on, on, on what you wanted to flush out and didn't flush out, the good thing is you can put a, wen a wetland on top of toxic materials or bayfill because it's not going to come up. I spend a lot of my time finding out what happens if you put a wetland right on nasty stuff and mostly it doesn't get through. So, you know, you've got options there depending on your contaminants and what you want to put there. So you might want to put your wetlands on your, over your nastiest areas and leave the good areas for yourself. Uh, regional board. I found regional boards really cooperative. They're really willing to work with you. I find them very good. And they're in a hard place, of course, because they've got, you know, dischargers, manufacturers, home, owner, home builders on one side. They've got environmental groups on the other, and they get hit from both sides. So sometimes I think they're angels. What I found is if you're starting to get areas like the Irvine Ranch Water District Sanctuary Wetland, we have a, a small hut in that place for the Audubon Society. The Audubon Society was part of the design from what the word got one, you know, when we started. If that's so, y you know, who's going to oppose the Audubon Society? You know, you've already taken what the environmental groups want and try and go even further. I did a project in Spain once where I just went completely around. I said, we can do much, much better than anything you can think of and brought them back to my side to some extent. So that's how I would work with the regional board. They're looking to, to get an, an, you know, a win-win situation. And in this case, since you have some land you're going to use, you can have wetlands in it, you have some water, you have a chance to build something that they like. Now, of course, they're going to insist on protection and many things. But one of the ways to get around that is, yes, regional board, we understand there are unknowns, but we will monitor. We will commit so much money to monitor these pollutants and make sure they never do get high. And if they do, we'll, we'll do something about it so that you never get a Kesterson in your own backyard. That's, I think, the best way. And these monitoring pro programs don't have to be very expensive. I can design cheap ones. I mean, obviously, some people like to do large ones, but there's ways to around that. Thank you. Good, okay. Hi. I, uh, I wanted to ask questions in the very beginning, um, so I'm glad to be able to ask now. So, so I understand sometimes the best solutions are the simplest ones, but I saw pictures of Berkeley students going out and they're just planting cattails and uh -huh. creating wetlands. And it, it's hard for me to understand, so help me understand, how something as toxic as, you know, everything that's been dumped on this site for years and years and years could be mitigated um, by creating wetlands, like uh, it's hard for me to imagine that birds could live there or anything could live there. So, yeah, I mean that's a really good question. Obviously, it's one that, especially since I spent that time at Kesterson Reservoir with the selenium and the dead birds. Uh, well, you have to separate the two spatially and temporally, so that the birds never see the toxicants. The toxicants are there. Some of them are going to be there forever. But if you cover them over with with either a geomembrane. Uh, you might have to put some fill underneath there. You could put clay. You could put a membrane. But the roots themselves pretty soon form a really impermeable area. So a lot of that pollution you would bury, and it would stay there forever, uh, so long as you don't mobilize it. And you would mobilize it by passing water through it. And if you kept most of the water off, which is what you would do, you know, the water that drains now into the bay fill, it sits there, it leaches out, chemical reactions occur, and out comes this toxic brew. Well, one of the things you'd do is you'd make sure that water doesn't get in, most of it. What water did get in, you could even pump it out and you'd put it into your wetlands. Now, it could be with some compounds, selenium's one, uh, mercury's another, you wouldn't want to build a wetland that was available to birds. You'd build a pre-unit wetland, which would look like a wetland without any water. Uh, or it might look like a box with gravel in it and organics. And that would get rid of the, the nastier toxins that you wouldn't want to see going around. But most of them... We can get them into the wetland in fairly small quantities because the water's flowing through. They build up, but they never get to build up because we get them down to the bottom or broken down. So that's where the, the design and the unit process excels. If you have it in an ordinary wetland like the Kesterson one where the water just flushed in, no, it wasn't possible. We could have rebuilt the Kesterson with a pre-wetland that would have taken out maybe 90% of the, the, the toxicity. Uh, but we didn't know that at the time. So that's it. You've got to keep them separate. So you've got to think about it when you do it, and that's why we need a team. 
you know, because anybody, you, me, and all of us, we might forget something. So you need people to go back and criticize and come back and forth. Okay, we can't do that. We can do this. Will this work? Will that work? Uh, that's how I'd go about it. So the other thing that you talked about was, you know, using conventional means in some cases. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I didn't see that in your presentation because this is the focus of yeah. what you do. So do you think for our site that it would require some conventional means as well? Well, let's take waste treatment, you know, just sewage. Right. A wetland can't handle raw sewage. It needs at least an oxidation stage. So what's called a primary and a secondary stage in a waste treatment plant, you would need. You, they don't have to be the, the fancy ones, but they have to be something like that. You have to get all that organic matter oxidized, which you usually do by stirring it around with air, and uh, convert it into inorganic material. But the standards for disposal of such waste if that's all you did into San Francisco Bay, would be such you couldn't do it. You'd have to do further treatment, advanced secondary treatment, or other things. Mm -hmm. With a wetland, you don't have to. They can take that stage. If we're talking about, let's say you've got a pool here of, uh, I don't know what's in here, but say you've got some chromium. None of us like chromium. If the concentration was fairly high, a standard conventional treatment system is the way to go, where you'd precipitate it. Often all you have to do with many of these things is change the pH with calcium carbonate, like limestone, ground limestone, and down it goes. The problem is that it's still toxic when you've done, when that process has worked, and you have to really work hard, like membrane filtration or reverse osmosis, to get it down to the levels to protect the bay. That's where the wetland would come in. That's what I mean by a combination. Mm -hmm. A lot of the pollutants that, as far as I can see from just skimming through all the EIRs and stuff, the concentrations are not that high. And they could be dealt with in a wetland or a, a modified wetland cell. But one of the great things is if you've got, you know, wastewater, your own source of water, fresh water is valuable, you know. And we could use it, of course, to irrigate lawns and golf courses, but we could also use it to grow uh, wildlife plants and, and other things. Okay, thank you. Um, I have two questions. Um, one is that, um, just so we can wrap our heads around this, if you were to design this project, kind of how, what size wetlands would you be looking at? So we sort of know what we should be looking at versus what the developer wants, you know, and, and thinking about compromise. Um, and then my second question is, uh, have you ever come across a situation where uh, a cell or a soil became so saturated that you had to um, rework it? And, and what are the strategies and processes that would go through if, if something went off? Okay. So the first strategy is how big? And that's what you, people usually call I'm usually driving along and they ask me and they have to say, you know, and so I have a rule for them about that. But um, You usually need like 15 acres for each MGD of typical wastewater you have. Well, you ain't going to generate that from your wastewater system. There's enough of you, even if you would double or triple the population. Uh, your water that leaches out that you want to clean up, the, the leach weight water, would also, the volume wouldn't be that high. So the actual treatment wetlands might not be more than, say, 50 acres. But of course, I like as many wetlands as I can get because I want them to be a park. So beyond that, I would negotiate with, with the designer, the landscape architects and people and say, well, uh, what looks best? Um, so I'm, I'm guessing something like that. I don't know the volume of the contaminant concentrations, but that's the kind of thing you'd be looking at. But I'd love to have twice, three to four times as much as that because I could have more birds, more wildlife and more walks. In terms of do they, do they get saturated? Well, the answer is so far is no. And one reason is we try to design them so we metabolize the pollutants and they go off as gases or CO2 or nitrogen gas or something like that. Those that aren't, like metals, and to some extent the organics, uh, what happens, of course, is every year we get a new layer of peat building because the more dead plants form down. And the standards for solid metals, for example, I'll give you a good example. We were talking about the standards for copper in water, say, 5, 10, milligram, micrograms per liter. Now, 
the, if you took a, a litre of soil, so to speak, a litre of volume of soil, the standard is 25 milligrams, you know, a thousand times more. So you would never get up to the standard of saturation for those things. Um, the, the things you could get are byproducts of some of the organics that are broken down partially and become more toxic. That doesn't seem to happen very often. And that's what a lot of the research about the pharmaceuticals is about. What the maintenance would be, uh, in the end, is the thing fills up with peat. And one way is just to let it dry, and it'll go back down again. It'll oxidize. Like, you remember the delta used to be 20 feet higher than it is? And it's gone down 20 feet in 100 years because the farmers oxidize all the peat away. You could use it for landfill because it will meet all the standards because the concentration, of course, is so diluted by this massive material that you're making. So it's self-renewing in that sense, which is a fortunate coincidence. So the biggest thing was we think somewhere probably 20 to 40 years, you'd either have to dig it out and use it as compost or burn it or you know, have two or three in parallel and let it go back down again. So no problems there that we've found so far. Thanks for your presentation. It's really fascinating. I have a lot of questions. Um, so I'm trying to find out in, uh, where this fresh water is going to come from, and especially if we're experiencing the extreme drought conditions that we are. And you were saying that we can't just take the um, wastewater that's not treated. So if it is going to come from treated wastewater, I know they treat it with chloramines, and I know that chloramines are not conducive to uh, wildlife survival. So I'm wondering if I'm understanding correctly where this water yeah, would be coming we, from. Well, that's a good question, but let's, let's make the clarity here. Drinking water is treated with chloramines now, uh -huh. so that the people at the end of the pipe can still have safe water. When they're treating wastewater, you're mm -hmm. also right, they also have chloramines, but they can dechlorinate it, dechloraminate it. I uh -huh. worked on this back in the early 70s. And so, depending on where you want the water to go, and all water going into the bay now, it's a very simple dechlorination process. So, the wastewater would be treated, uh, and it would come, I think, not as heavy, highly as it might, you know, some other places would be, because the wetlands would do the rest. It would then come out of the pipe, we'd dechlorinate it, because you wouldn't want it in the wetland either. Mm -hmm. And it's an easy process, sulfite gets rid of it. Sulfate, sorry. And then uh, uh, you still have the ammonia, which is in there, which would be nitrified, you'd have right. to nitrify it. And then that would go into the wetland. So you would produce a, you'd have to produce a wastewater that was not toxic before you could put it into a wetland. It can have a little bit of toxicity, like a little bit of ammonia and you know, other things like that. So that was, that was how we'd get rid of that one. The chloramines, you can get rid of, fortunately. Chloramine is when chlorine and ammonia get together. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what used to happen. It used to be pretty toxic when they put it in the bay. And so my early research was to show how toxic it was, and then we got rid of it uh, by a fairly simple process. But then, does the sulfites and the nitrates, do they neutralize the chloramine, at, or, and what they happens to... They break it back down again. It goes back down into ammonia and chlorine and ions. And the sulfites and the nitrates are not dangerous, then, for the no, water? No, no. Nitrate, well, nitrate's dangerous for drinking water for children if it gets up to, uh, to above 10 milligrams per liter as nitrogen. And in the water, it will have about 15 to 20. But you're not going to give it to children to drink or humans. It's going into your wetlands or somewhere else. And then you'll strip the nitrogen out. Uh -huh. Does that, is that am I yeah. being clear there? The um, sulfate, sulfates you don't worry about because the concentration is, is really low because we start off with very, very low sulfate water. Okay. So, and so you're talking about that we would need to have separate uh, wetlands, a, a fresh water and a salt water or brackish. Uh, I think since you buy the bay and everything, you would probably want some brackish water wetlands. And you'd make those by having, you know, you have the, the sea here, uh -huh. and then you have the freshwater ones here, and then the intermediate with the, bra the, with the brackish ones that be somewhat salty. But it'd be sea salt that yeah. would do it. And so is there a problem then, like, in terms of the sea level rising if they, the salt water then goes into the freshwater wetlands? Well, there's no problem for the wetland, but there's a problem for you because you've been flooded. Yeah, true. Uh, <laughs> we're working on sea level rise. On a, we have a project called Oraloma, which is over in East Bay, and we're working now on how to uh, modify levees with wetlands and that will also be waste treatment systems. So it's a mul we envisage the whole bay would be ringed by these things in the end. And, you know, because sea level rise is not very much, but, you know, it, it keeps going. Uh, mm. Uh, the project is called Oraloma, yeah, O-R-A, and then L-O-M-A, and it's, it's a pilot project, I think the state has funded it now, um, and Stanford and Berkeley and the Renew It project that I mentioned are looking at this, and it will be a combination of 
modified levees where the levees have plants growing on them, native plants, which can also be persuaded to do some, some waste treatment. They're sort of dryish wetlands, but they're not very efficient, but we can have a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And then we would have uh, water flowing along the top. We'd have other treatment processes and bird life and so on. And that's our idea to make a first cut at, at that. So in, in this case here, you'd have to do the same thing because you're at low levels. But, you know, the, the things that lived in the wetland when it was fresh would die when the, when the salt water came in, mm -hmm. but new ones would come in. And brackish water wetlands are more productive than any of the others. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, it'd be better to have them. But, you know, freshwater ones are fairly rare around here, so I like to have those as well. So okay. the sea would be okay, but, but let's keep it where it, we don't want it. <laughs> where we want it, rather. Okay. Thank you. I'm thinking that... <clears throat> The water that would go into these wetlands would come from more than one source. Part of it would be runoff from San Bruno Mountain, the, this little... Stormwater, rainwater. Stormwater, yeah. rainwater, right. Yep. Um, part of it would be coming from an area that was very contaminated um, mm -hmm. in the past. Um, uh, there's a, there's a, a, a little constructed... They call it a marsh, but it's all, but it's all um, uh, concrete. Um, uh, with like lamp black and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. The, the other, another source would be um, rainwater from the, the project itself, from the, the, the area of the project itself. And another source would be leachate from, yeah. the, from the landfill, which is, which, com which probably communicates with the bay. Mm -hmm. So that would be brackish, mm -hmm. at least. Um, and another source would be partially, all partially treated waste water mm -hmm. from uses on the project site. That sounds like a really, co really um, complicated mix of inputs, and not, you might not want to, anyway, how do you, how do you work that out? That out that that uh, it, it a complicated a different a mix of inputs with a mix of different problems mm -hmm. to solve. Yeah, well, that would be a fairly difficult problem to uh, to solve, as you've you've uh, said here, because first of all, it doesn't rain in summer, so we get all the fresh water at one time, and you can of course store that to some extent. You can run a wetland a bit higher. You can have a wetland that has higher water. You can run it down to low levels. Wetlands don't need to have actual surface water at all. You can run them with the water down eight inches below and the roots will still pick it up. We tend to have surface water because we want the birds to fly around in it and the insects and dragonflies. I, I love dragonflies, so I like some surface water. Um, something like lamp black, I don't even know you'd want to deal with in a wetland. You might not want to let that in particularly. You might want to keep that out. Leachate wetlands, uh, sometimes, as I mentioned with chromium and, and maybe mercury, uh, you, don't want to, you don't want that to get in your wetland at all. You want to stop it in a kind of pre-wetland. Uh, and you can make wetlands, for example, if the water is just below the surface, uh, or you have a cover over them, then the insects can't get in, the birds can't get in, and you don't transmit any toxicity. Another one was you probably could blend it. You know, that blended mix would give you a more or less constant feed. But if you're pumping groundwater that's toxic out, you've got to control over that. If you pump it, if you've got to keep continuing to pump your brown water. Now, if it's salty or saline, wetlands in the valley, for example, they go to one-third seawater every year when they dry down. So a lot of the plants and insects can ha quite happily handle a large range. These, these are not often very, uh, they're pretty tough guys, a lot of these wetland guys. So a mixture of sources, yeah, you'd need to know what they were, you'd need to know what the volumes were. The volume of, of treated wastewater is not going to be too high, the vol but it'll be constant. The volume of from uh, the, uh, well, if you have, other than a stadium, when of course it all comes at half time. Uh, but you could, you could handle all those with, with containers because the volumes are not too high. So it would be a problem that certainly needed very careful consideration. And you'd have to look at each of the different contaminants. For example, I looked at some ammonia levels. The ammonia levels are about one to two milligrams per liter. That's not a big deal. It, it wouldn't be very good if you were a trout swimming in it and, it and it was warm and 
pH was high. But you could deal with that by putting that into a wetland without any trouble. If it was 20 milligrams, like it would be from a waste treatment plant without nitrification, it would be a real problem. You get mosquitoes. Vector control is really important, so you have to keep the mosquito people on your side, uh, which you usually do with natural insect. Natural insect eaters, very often mosquito fish, but we've been working with native fish as well. So you've, you've hit on a difficult problem to solve, but it's not insoluble. It just means you've got to think about it. And with the unit process, you've got a chance to, to keep things separate. Again, that was an early question. How do you separate the toxics from the wildlife? Space and time. Um, OK, I actually have a lot of thoughts, and I'm not certain I have a complete question, because I have something similar to what Greg was saying about, OK, and what Mary has said is one that we've got multiple problems and if we have a wastewater treatment that is only supposed to scalp the water off and then magically it's a tertiary water that would become wetlands and so I'm you know we were thinking that we would do the tertiary water treatment here and then send the heavier elements off to a, a full-blown wastewater treatment plant are there small systems that can, that can do that? Um, similar to what Greg was saying, how close to that initial tertiary treatment area should people be to not experience the smells or exposure uh, to anything that might volatilize? Um, is there kind of like a parameter don't build the houses any closer than 10,000 feet or something like that. And also, um, I've heard from uh, watershed and uh, wetlands people that we should be designing our communities to anticipate the wetland needs of the future which would be this buffer zone between what's currently, where our bay currently is, and how the um, water's sea level rise might impact, and how do we design our wetlands to be effective during that change? Um, okay, and I think that's pretty much... Well how close to the yeah, environment and to kill pathogens like one of my questions is would you have to introduce heat to kill ha pathogens what i mean how do you get to that point where your tertiary water is oh, yeah, okay, so uh, going into your wetland without a major yeah i think there's a wastewater pr plant a first that the wetland doesn't need tertiary tr treated water it will treat the water rapidly to make it to tertiary which gives you a savings in the conventional treatment. And as, as there are all sizes and shapes and kinds of waste treatment, from, from simple systems that are cheap, uh, usually they use more space and take longer, to ones that are packet plants, like you'd, if you bought a, uh, uh, if you went to uh, the Caribbean and you went to a hotel there, you'd, they have a package plant that sits outside, which is fairly advanced and small package, but it's expensive. So there's a whole like range. A diesel, like a diesel generator or yeah, something generator that would run, kick it on when it's needed? Run. Okay. The, you'd have things like activated charcoal, uh, which is, you know, just like uh, coke, really, okay. or, or briquettes a bit. Uh, and that's a very good filter, but it's very expensive. It has to be cleaned. It has to be charged up. You don't need those things if you're going to let the wetland do it for you because you've got space and time to help you get rid of the problems. In terms of pathogens, I wouldn't, I mean, we do work with pathogen removal in wetlands, but this is not for us. Uh, this is for other things to see if we can do it in places where we can't with treatment. I would just sterilize it normally. I don't think the regional board would let you do anything else anyway. It's easy, it's cheap, we know how to do it. Mm -hmm. We can do it with U ultraviolet light, or we can do it with, with chlorine, or chloramines, or any, any number of other things. It's safe, we use it all the time. You wouldn't want even to risk that. So the thing is you don't, the wetland can take water that's, that's not very clean, so long as it's been well oxidized, uh, you'd presumably, you'd get something like you'd put on your, uh, when you, when you use recycled wastewater for your golf course or your soccer fields, that has to be oxidized, filtered, and sterilized. Uh, that's the, probably the, what you'd have. You'd, you'd need to get rid of the, 
the sterilized chlorine. The chloramines that were mentioned before, you get rid of those. But a lot of the other stuff, there's a problem if it's going to go out into the bay, like the metals at low levels, uh, organics at low levels, pharmaceuticals, you know, like ibuprofen and uh, birth control pills that damage the fish. That wetland can take those out much better than the treatment plant can. So you'd, you'd go back and forth. Um, in terms of the next question about the buffer and this, the, the ones, I'm working in a team now which has a, a pure wetlands biologist, a sea level phys physical guy, and myself in the Oraloma project I mentioned. And we're taking that buffer consideration uh, that you'll have to think about. Mm -hmm. But you've got time to think about it. And uh, that concept is probably the only way we've got other than filling it back up. I mean, of course, you can fill yourself up or you can build a seawall. I mean, there are other solutions. There's physical solutions like a seawall. Uh, I think a living seawall like this that would help, you know, the wildlife uh, as, and also act as a buffer. Obviously, if, if you've got a slope like this with vegetation on it, it's much harder for waves, even in a storm, to smash it all down than if it's a hard seawall like that that gets a crack in it and then a wave whacks it and blows it open. So I think that would, you're right, that's what we have to consider, but I think it's at least beginning to be considered by all of us now. Uh, we've got some time, of course, for that one. What was the middle question? Um, I the smells. Oh, oh the smells. Uh, how, yeah. how close and... Close, yeah. If we do it the way I've suggested, I think, apart from the fact you wouldn't be walking into the water, mm -hmm. there, is no, there are no pathogens there other than what birds poop. Uh, we've lived with those before. Uh, there's no smell. I had to guarantee in, in Irvine there was no smell. The guys, that, that, they were fairly burly developers, those two, and they, they wanted to make sure that, and I guaranteed no smell. You'll see smell around the bay, but that's when it's seawater, and that's because seawater has a lot more sulfate in it. And the sulfate, under anoxic conditions, goes to sulfide, which is hydrogen sulfide, the bad egg smell that we don't want. And you can see that. In fact, if you look, sometimes you'll see where the sulfur is oxidized, it's white or yellowish white. Mm -hmm. You never get that in freshwater wetlands. I've never seen it yet because there's not enough sulfur, sulfate in the water to generate that. But we have them anoxic. There's certainly the hydrogen sulfide could be generated, but we need some of it because that's what binds the metals. But it's not enough for us to smell. So we keep it down at that level. So I don't see a problem there of, of toxicity. I mean, I've worked around these things a lot, and uh, that's not a problem I've ever thought that's ever going to worry me. Thank you. Losing my cell phone in the water is sometimes <laughs> happens. Hello. Hello. Uh, you answered one of the questions that I had was, would increasing the tidal flow influence the oxygenation process uh, outside of giving a smell, which you could probably mask or dampen? You mean into the lagoon? Into, you mean into the lagoon? So there is a tidal influence. Yeah. The time. Well, I mentioned at the end of my talk about the, uh, uh, the lagoon. And yes, if you brought more water in, it would bring more oxygen in with it. But as it goes out, it might take less out, and you might get a problem there by taking, you know, reducing the oxygen in that area too. So you could see that, and you know, it could be measured easily. Right. That was my next question. What monitoring device can be used to determine the continuing health of the lagoon? Because there are so many things that will continually impact it for the next yeah. 20, 30, 100 years. Sure. Hi. <laughs> what monitoring device or devices can be used uh, to show the health of the lagoon? Because it is going to be impacted by a number of things uh, over the next 20, 30, and perhaps forever. Yeah, there are monitoring packages where you can get automatic stuff that you, you put it down on the web, you know, or you can get a little one handheld, one that you stick in the water yourself. The most important one, first of all, would be oxygen, dissolved oxygen. Okay. Because if dissolved oxygen is high, all sorts of other things that could be a problem aren't anymore. Uh, for instance, ammonia is toxic to fish. But if there's a lot of oxygen there, they can get by a lot better without it. Uh, with, you know, with the higher oxygen, if they've, got, uh, if they've got higher oxygen, they can get by with higher ammonia. And it's true of just about anything else, because anything that affects their gills. So I would use oxygen as number one. pH, which is how acid or alkaline it is, is another one. And you would want to look at temperature. Uh, because that affects the oxygen and the pH. And maybe two or three other parameters. I wouldn't think you'd need to do the fancy ones beyond that. Is there any plant you could put in that would tell you, give you an early warning? You know, oxygen, if you've got a continuous recording probe, oxygen is a really good 
idea of, he starts to drift, drift down, you know, and you begin to see it. Uh, you don't see this if you send somebody out every week with a probe sometimes, because they don't go out at night. Sometimes the oxygen's worse at four o'clock in the morning. Right, right, right. The thing is, there are ways to, to, to make sure the oxygen is always up. And I do a lot of work in reservoirs particularly, but also sometimes in estuaries, where we actually add the oxygen. If it's short of oxygen, and we can't think of any other way to get it up, we add it. I mean, I'm an engineer. You're short of oxygen, add it. So think of yourself, you know, as soon as I, I had a, a kidney stone not too long ago, and first thing they did is they stuck an oxygen tube up my nose. Well, you can do that with a lake or, a, or an estuary like this. You can do it with pure oxygen. You can do it with, with compressors and mix the water around a bit. Uh, oxygen's really cheap, especially here, because it's a byproduct of all our industries, our semiconductor industries and hospitals. So, um, yeah, I think you should monitor the lagoon. And I think something like oxygen temperature pH would be a first three to think about. And that can be automatically monitored even by... Yeah, I mean, you know, they're, they're, uh, these things, run, they started about, you know, one or two thousand dollars, then they run up to twenty, thirty thousand, depending whether you want it to go up and down or whatever else you want. But we have a bunch of them now that we, uh, we routinely measure some of our wetlands in Discovery Bay. We just look on the web and see what's going on. We don't even have to go out there. Students love it. <laughs> Thank you. But your lagoon's a real jewel, you know. There aren't too many around the bay. I mean, there's uh, um, Lake Merritt, which has an oxygen problem in, uh, in Oakland. And it's just a jewel to be able to walk around that. And so it's really nice to make sure it's healthy. Speaking of the lagoon, you mentioned that you worked on Mountain Lake, um, which I, I don't know if everybody knows. Mountain Lake is in the Presidio. They've done a fabulous job restoring it. Um, it's right next to 101, oh, to Highway 1. Um, and so there was, anyway, it, it was a mess. Um, and one of the things that was done at Mountain Lake was dredging. I am very concerned about what is in the sediments underneath the lagoon. And I'm just wondering what your experience was with, it, with, with dredging Mountain Lake and if you have any other experiences with dredging around the bay. Well, the experience at Mountain Lake is, I think it was 1995 I went to a citizens meeting like this, and then we had a charrette after design charrette, and I said to them, look, you know, you're going to have to dredge this lake because, you know, it's, it's, first of all, it used to be 20, 30 feet deep, and it's now you can walk across it. You know, it's just, that's what you've got to do. Now, they were all worried about trucks running through the, you know, their, ho their ha streets and all that kind of stuff. We, in fact, we got it actually dredged onto the freeway. What happened there was because of the lead in gasoline, the, uh, the rain washed the, the leaded exhaust that had accumulated on the road and the vegetation into the lake. So the lake had a sediment that was rich in lead in places. So Caltrans was the money bikes because dredging is very expensive. It can be cheaper, but if it's toxic, it's expensive. They spent eight to twelve million dollars on that dredging. It's only four acres. And it's a pretty small thing. But we took out, I was able to redesign the lake bed, which I thought was wonderful. I could get it back to not to the original because you wouldn't want it to be original, but, but some nice shape that would be easy to work with. Uh, and we have an aeration system in that lake and we're trying to restore native plants. Around the bay, uh, bay sediments, not just our bay, but Newport Bay, uh, anywhere where there's been any kind of military action in particular, there's a lot of paint chips, lead, uh, chromium, a lot of other stuff like that. And sometimes mercury from the gold mines, though we don't, you don't have that here, I don't think. You're not in the right place. Uh, and you don't have local, gold lo local mercury mines here, I don't think. I don't know of any mercury mines here. Uh, the regional board's attitude is, is let sleeping dogs lie if they can. If it's covered over and not getting through, they tend to say, well, because dredging is so expensive, let's leave it, I leave it in. And I would agree with them, except that there's probably some hot spots which would be worth cleaning it. Well, sh you should clean out, perhaps. Uh, but if something's under that much mud and you're not going to disturb it, it's probably not going to get out. You know, some things burrow down, but mostly worms and things in the sea, they don't burrow down very far. They just go down a little way. So you can, you can establish that kind of thing. And, and they have their own mechanisms to... Uh, in fact, one of my students and I did some research on, on mercury in, in, uh, in the lakes and reservoirs around here, and we wondered why they were living and, and how they could manage this mercury. Because, you know, some of the places like near the new Almadane mine, you know, in, in, over in South Bay, that's pretty nasty. Well, what they do is they put it in a tail segment and then they just lop off the tail segment. 
it's really an amazing sort of adaptation to, uh, to toxicity. It's quite, quite amazing. Uh, you know, uh, and a lot of things actually store metals in their skin, like a lot of worms can store it in their skin, and sometimes their teeth as well. Uh, we store mer put mercury out in our head. You know the story about Newton when he was not too, too bright, you know, he was doing a lot of alchemy. When he wasn't doing, discovering gravity and stuff, he was, he was trying to turn go le uh, mercury into gold. And, of course, the fumes came out. And he sent a lock of his hair to a girlfriend one time, and she kept it, and they analyzed it. And sure enough, he was as mad as a hatter. You know, he got lead in his, in, mercury in his, in his hair. So there are ways things can handle uh, a certain amount of toxicity. So though it's not ideal, given the cost of dredging a large area, you might want to just go for your hot spots. The other thing is, again, this oxygenation and aeration stuff that I like to do, if there's plenty of oxygen, most of these metals don't appear. For instance, toxic mercury cannot stand oxygen. You don't get methy, what's called methyl mercury, which is the toxic form, if there's any oxygen at all there. So again, oxygen's one of your keys for the, the, the aquatic side. Either, you know, there's many ways to do it, but you can think about doing it that way. So I, I, I wouldn't, I mean, there's, PC, there's all sorts of nasty stuff in the bay, but I'm not sure there's that much here because I don't know what the industry was. I don't think you had a, ship, a shipyard. And those are the usual buildings around here. In, in Yeah, but that would have been dumped, wouldn't it? Not put in the water necessarily. Anyway, you could find that out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the. Mm -hmm. Well, some of the stuff lasts, of course, thousands of years. Yeah. But I can take out, I've, I've not done this with a, a treatment wetland, but I work a lot with radioactive substances and so I'm very careful with them. But you can take them out with a wetland just like anything else, but you just don't want like, people and animals into it. You know, you'd, you'd keep it to you and the plants kind of thing and the bacteria. So it can be, it can be mobilized. And if you can immobilize copper or mercury, you can immobilize radioactive copper, radioactive mercury, or radioactive lead. So it can be done. So, sorry. We'll, we'll deal with that one in a minute. That's a bit speculative, though. Yes. About the aer aeration of the lagoon. In Europe, I've seen some uh, urban water shallow uh, with a fountain in the middle. Yes. That shoots up mm -hmm. all the time and aerates mm -hmm. the water. And uh, I kind of thought at one point that the lagoon could have one of those. It would be a nice feature. <laughs> scenic feature to have a spouting yeah. what do you think well i think it's a nice scenic feature especially if you put spotlights on it at night if you've ever been to geneva they've got that one that's 100 meters high <coughs> it, they, it's natural they take it from their mountains nearby and it comes up and they place you know because it's outside the casinos there and they play spotlights on it, it looks lovely uh they don't unfortunately aerate very well not very efficient a lot of the energy goes into spurting the water up but they look nice we have one in lake Merritt. Uh, and it certainly does no harm and it does some good. But you really want to get the, the mixing down, if you're going to mix it, right at the bottom. And so uh, we tend to put little bubblers, or well, big bubblers, at the bottom, about a foot from the bottom, and stir it that way. I'm doing a project down in Southern California like that right now. But in fact, I'm using an English expert, or so a European expert, who works a lot in Holland, uh, where they've developed these techniques further than we have. Uh, so that could be used. It depends on, on the hydraulics. Sometimes uh, water bodies develop two layers, a warm one on the top and a cold one on the bottom, and they don't mix. And the bottom one runs out of oxygen and things get bad, depending on the depth and the wind and the salinity. So I don't know for your lagoon. But getting oxygen there is the key thing, and if you can do it with, uh, with bubblers and have a fountain as well to look good. Uh, I like fountains, I mean, I love fountains, but they're just not very efficient in terms of moving the water around. Or sometimes you might actually have to just get a tank and you put pure oxygen in. Um, Oakland's drinking water supply has such a system that I designed up in the, uh, uh, up on the McCollum River in Pardee, uh, not Pardee, in uh, Comanche Reservoir. And we're building them in, I've got another one that we've built in Cherry Creek, which is an 800 acre shallow lagoon in Denver, again, to, to uh, try and improve the uh, water quality for the wildlife and the, in this case, drinking water. We had a, another question. 
get it recorded properly. Then. So I was, you, you mentioned, radio, we were talking about yep. radioactivity and also all the other toxins as it's um, are restoring. How do you keep the, the wildlife out of it in terms of the harm that might happen yeah. to it? Yeah, this, again, it's a kinetic problem. It's a space and time thing. I've, the, the reason I've worked a lot with radioactive metals, like radioactive lead and copper, which are very nasty and awkward to deal with, you know, we're behind two, two inches of lead when we work with them, is to find out what happens when we put them in a simulated wetland. Obviously, we can't put these things in a real wetland, but we make a wetland in a bucket and we, uh, we add the materials. And what happens is they very rapidly move from the soluble form into the sediments. And then they become rapidly converted into the immobile form. Now, for radiation, you, would, you, know, you don't want anything near it ever until the radiation has gone away. But for most of the, the, the materials, like toxic metals, once it gets back into the ore, it's like a copper penny. You, know, you can put it in a glass of water and nothing much will happen. So, so long as you get it immobilized, in this particular case, to the sulfide, or some, some form that just is not biologically available. I mean, a worm can eat it, and it'll go straight through un untouched. Uh, that's what you have to do. Make sure that it's in a condition where it will never come back again. And if you think how, how, how mines work and they go wrong, you know, you dig out the ore and everything, and then you pile all the waste up in heaps, heaps of rock. Well, the water goes, rainwater goes through the rock, but there's plenty of oxygen because it's quite porous. And the bacteria that live in there, they love oxygen and they love the metal. And so they oxidize the metals, usually starting with iron, and that makes acid. And the acid then leaches out all the nasty metals. Well, if there's never any oxygen there, it would never happen. I've, in fact, I've designed a process where we stuff the, the, uh, the mine itself, the mine shaft, with organic matter so that it's, there's never any oxygen, so the, the toxins never get out. It's a, uh, we never completed that project because we lost our, uh, uh, one of the guys in that, uh, that plane crash in the field in Pennsylvania. That was... Uh, Islamic terrorist ones, he was on lower that plane. So we never did finish that project. But those are the ideas. It, again, it's, it's, it's chemistry in action, you know, and will it work for your situation? Obviously it works, but will it work for you? And that would require a bit more thinking about in a, a bigger team where somebody could say, I'm an expert too and you're wrong. That's what we need at these meetings so that we don't make mistakes. But for the radioactive ones, I mean, it's something you could do, but obviously you'd do, do that in a closed system well, the plant roots might get down there, or plant, or plant matter might get in there, but you would keep it shielded from everything else. I, I, with all these toxins, you've got to know what form they're in and where they are. You know, that, 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 that we don't want them, but at least if we know where they are and what form they're in, are they available or not, we've got a chance. I, I was I was happy to hear that uh, sideways reference to um, the scientific method um, in your answer to that question, um, and I I I think all of us have have uh, enjoyed your presentation. You're you're a very entertaining person, um, and we just have and you you've just given us so much to think about. I it's it's very exciting to me that there is this this prospect for a continual you know a continual cleaning up of the nasty junk that human beings have thrown into the bay and into the water uh, in this area um, in the world in this world um, is there anybody else who wants to ask a question or make a comment or would you like to make some Clara would you ask a question? yes Yeah, yeah, how much continuing maintenance do the wetlands need? They're amazingly maintenance-free. Uh, the ones that have been running down in Southern California, the 400-acre the Prado wetlands, uh, the maintenance we've had there, we've got a lot of water going through. We've got half a river going through there. Half the Santa Ana River goes through that wetland. The maintenance problems we've had have been uh, if any pipes get blocked up, if some 
wetland material, or in one case a dead duck or something like that, got stuck in a pipe and caused a blockage. So that's a pretty simple maintenance. Most of the cost, and that one is, well, you can work out your cost. That's, that's 400 acres, and it costs $250,000 a year, of which about 150000 is the guy's salary plus benefits who looks after it and also takes the measurements. And the rest is chemical measurements and that kind of stuff. Every 20 to 40 years, you'd have to dig them out. You know, that's not an expensive business with, since they're not toxic sediments, we, we're uh, saying. Um, so they go on pretty well. You know, you might adjust the water flow a little bit here and there, but it's really very little maintenance because you don't harvest. Some people like to harvest wetlands and take the pollutants away. It's, it's, it's crazy because the pollutants mostly don't go into the plants, and if they do, you wouldn't want them in the plants because you'd have toxic butterflies. I mean, so just harvesting them, the, the amount, if you take something like a heavy metal, it's like 0.0001% of dry weight. So you'd need a railroad hauling the stuff away every day to get any kind of removal that would be significant. Much better to immobilize them where they are. You know where they are right in the sediment there where you know exactly where they are and you can test for them. So maintenance is not one of your problems, fortunately. And nor is planting and creating. We talk in terms of anywhere between $2,000 and $75,000 per acre to build a wetland. $75,000 is the Cadillac wetlands in Irvine. $2,000 is the Chevy wetland in Lodi. And it's mostly, mostly grading, putting in some pipes, and planting the plants. And it's roughly a dollar to buy the plant and a dollar to plant it. Um, it's, not, it's not a big deal. In fact, that's the reason we don't see so many, because what profit is there for an engineering firm if you're dealing with low-cost stuff? I mean, you know, that's... But, but like I say, we need the combination of conventional and wetlands. A lot of wetlands to this day are still, people sort of dip, flood somewhere, and it gets to be like a pond with reeds around the edges, which is a nice pond with reeds around the edges, but it's not going to give you much waste treatment. The, the key to waste treatment is, let's say these are your wetland, pieces of wetland material that are going to do the treatment, and I'm a pollutant coming along here. So if it, there's one clump of reeds there, another clump of reeds there, and I can go around it, I will because water flow would be impeded there, there'd be a hydraulic uh, resistance, and I go around it, I'd go out. So that's why a natural wetland, which has a channel through it usually, or a typical wetland that looks like a pond won't work very well. But if, if I can't get round, if I'm stuck and have to beat up against this thing, then that's where the process will occur. The process is, occurs mostly with bacteria which live in little slime. It's, it, we call them biofilms, but it's slime. And the animals and plants that live in there are the things that are our friends and are going to take away the pollutants and convert them into forms that uh, will be safe for us and for them. So I think that's it for me. Thank you very, very much. Don't know how to thank you. <laughs> <laughs>